So you talked about uh, the combustion chamber and how damn hot things get. Mm -hmm. uh, high pressure, a lot of heat. Uh, how do you keep the thing cool? You have a great video on this too. <laughs> how do you get it from, uh, from, from what do you call it? Me metal rich <laughs> engine rich How do you keep en engine it? rich from like the the metal from melting well one of the ways is to let it be engine rich there's actually you can use ablative cooling you can literally let um make the walls thicker than you normally make it make it out of a material that will ablate away that will kind of chip away and take some of the heat away with it it's very again primitive and it's actually what spacex first used on their first merlin engines they used ablative cooling um so it's basically a carbon nozzle and you just let it get Either the carbon, the inner layer of the of the engine was not it was carbon, and you just let it get chewed away and eaten away, and that's just something you factor in. Uh, it's not a uh, very elegant, and it's definitely not reusable in that sense. So there's probably really good models ab about like how it melts away, the the rate at which it melts away yeah. to know what thickness. Yeah, but boy, that's a dangerous. <laughs> I, I just this is part, part of the design. Seems so silly. So obviously, you probably. <laughs> You know, wow. it's again, it's not the most elegant. And the, the problem too, your your geometry physically is changing too, because as you're eroding the walls, now things like your expansion ratio or the ratio between your throat and the nozzle exit is changing. Yeah. Because the, the thickness, like the throat's diameter is actually like everything is changing. So it's it's not great. Um, it, it might might not be melting away uniformly. There could be some like weird pockets for aerodynamics oh, yeah. stuff. It's oh, just a, a bunch of chaos just can I, which <laughs> I can't so, imagine having to like figure all that stuff out, honestly. Yeah. Um so the uh, the more elegant thing to do, there's there's a couple other things you can do, but the kind of the most common one, especially when we're dealing with liquid fueled rockets, is something called regeneratively cooling. And the the idea is you basically just flow fuel or fuel or oxidizer through the walls of the of the nozzle in the chamber mm -hmm. um, before they go through like into the injector or into the actual combustion chamber. Mm -hmm. By doing that, you're you're taking heat out of the you know you're you're taking heat out of the metal of the walls. And you're putting it into the propellant. So you're typically heating the propellant up, which is, remember when I said there's a gas interaction versus a liquid, like liquid gas. So lots of times, even if you pump them both at, you know, as um, they, you know, are both being pumped as liquids, by the time it goes through the walls of the chamber, lots of times one of them is phase changed into a gas. So now you do have that gas liquid interaction. Um, that's because they're using that, the fuel or the oxidizer to, to cool the walls of the, of the engine. So when you look at a rocket engine, although it looks like, you know, a nice, beautifully uniform cylinder, you know, smooth thing. Um, there's either, there's oftentimes like a, the channels actually like milled into the walls mm -hmm. that they run fuel through. And even though they're tight, you know, they can be like two, three millimeters thick, mm -hmm. they'll actually still have a channel that goes down in U-turns and comes around and comes back wow. all the way down to the tip of the nozzle and everything. So it's, it's just insane that, you know, that- Isn't that's pre-designed and that that's, that's like, uh, so they design those channels. Yeah. There's probably some optimization there. Mm -hmm. Like how the flow happens. Well, especially because you you're thinking about a, a conical thing or like a semi conical thing where the the area is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You're flowing the same amount of propellant through it as you are down. To the, you know what I mean? Like the, yeah. the propellant has to. So they have all these unique things, like you know, sometimes uh, different manifolds where they'll inject more or less fuel in certain areas, and there must be like propellant uh, simulation software because they can't surely can't like test this on actual physical. Well, back in the day, they had to just build it. Well, you mean back in the, back in the day, <laughs> walked up uphill in both ways. <laughs> it was with, like, I mean, like any anything back in the day before computers, yeah, where you like had build. like sh <laughs> you just had to do it, and then, like your simulation or modeling was like a sheet of paper where you're like calculating stuff. Well, uh, but you can uh, heat flux, you know, like you can literally see how much energy and how much heat is inside the combustion chamber, how much, you know, and that is a, a, a measurable thing, even without a computer. Now I'm not near smart enough to do any of this. Like I've never tried measuring the heat flux of anything. I barely even know what that means. I'm just smart you enough to lived, regurgitate my it. Friend. <laughs> and you haven't so lived. The, <laughs> but that is something that they, people would calculate and they yeah, find out, okay, copper, you know, does a better job of transferring the heat between the walls of it and into the propellant, blah, 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 compared to X, Y, Z. Um, so, you know. Yeah, materials, people. I, like, I, I've met just in all, all walks of life, especially just uh, through MIT, through everywhere, where there's some people are just like 100X smarter than anyone you've ever met at a particular yes. thing. 
Like you mentioned copper. They'll know yes. the heat dissipation through different materials. They'll, they'll understand that like oh, more yeah. than, it's like, holy shit, it's possible for a human being oh. to deeply understand a thing. Dude, aerospace is full of that. You'll have people that are so niche in some thing that no, like the average person has never even remotely thought of. Yet this person has done it 40,000 different ways in a, you know, in a, an environment being like, well, we found out that if we turn it four degrees that way and add 4% niobium, you know, like just yeah. things you're like, what is your life? And yeah, how the, do you know this? You and, know? and the funny thing about them, they usually don't think it's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. usually like, they're, they're so nonchalant about it that if you don't actually, you have to know enough. You actually have to know quite a lot to appreciate how much more they know. <laughs> Yeah. Because otherwise you yeah. won't even notice it. Because our popular culture doesn't celebrate the intricacies of uh, scientific or engineering mastery, which is interesting. There's all these people that lurk in the shadows. Oh, I know. They're just geniuses. Yes. Like you see, you'll have like the LeBrons who are like good at basketball. So we understand that they're good at basketball. They, they do this thing with the ball and the hoop and they do like it really well, better than a lot of other people <laughs> under pressure. Well, like we celebrate- It's we give this them, big public spectacle. Yeah. Look at how great they are, yeah. But like the people like, yeah, at, at, uh, at these aerospace companies at NASA, at SpaceX, the kind of stuff they're doing, just the, the it, I mean, there's geniuses there. And it's actually mm -hmm. really inspiring. I mean, I've, um, I've interacted with a lot of brilliant people in the software world and maybe because I don't deeply understand a lot of hardware stuff, materials engineering, mechanical engineering, those people seem like so much smarter. I mean, it's always like the grass is green or whatever the right. expression is, but there's a depth of understanding yeah. that engineers have that do like mechanical engineering that's just awe-inspiring uh, to me. Well, not to get too like, uh, ex well, I don't know what the word would be, introverted or something or whatever, but that's actually kind of the whole point of everyday astronaut, like that's almost the whole point of what I do each year from the beginning. I, I did a thing called the Astro Awards, trying to be like a, an award show, hoping to, you know, lift up and celebrate and and shine a spotlight on the people that are actually doing the hard work and, and try to treat them like the, the rock stars that they are that we don't know about. And I think that's one of the things that for sure, I think, you know, I think Elon definitely helped make spaceflight cool, helped make that like a celebration thing where people are physically out cheering for rockets and science and space exploration. Um, but I think that's just the beginning, you know? I think like this should be a thing where the general public uh, looks to these people as as the coolest ones, as the, the coolest places to work, as the most important things. You know, sports are great and everything. I'm a big Formula One fan and things like that. But, you know, at the same time, like we should be celebrating the people doing this crazy work, you know, go, clocking in countless hours, just trying to figure out this one little thing that's gonna help us further our understanding. I mean, what's cooler than a giant thing with a really hot fire that, <laughs> that goes boom and it goes up into the air? I mean, like there's no, yeah. it's, it's like, to me, like bridges are inspiring. It's like uh, incredible architecture design and like the humans are able to uh, uh, work against nature, build these gigantic metal things, but like rockets. Yeah. With a, like a tiny little humans on top of them. <laughs> yeah. Flying out into space. It's like, the, it's the coolest possible thing. Everything comes together. All the different d disciplines come together for the high stakes drama uh, of, you know, riding that super powerful thing up away from the thing we call home, Earth. Exactly. It's like, it's so amazing. Exactly. So freaking amazing. Well, I think that's kind of part of my like story arc is I I just used to be a huge car and motorcycle guy. Like I just loved, you know, things that go fast and, you know, are loud and go fast and make lots of power. And at the end of the day, like at some point you realize nothing goes faster and it's louder and makes more power than yeah. a rocket. You know, and I think <laughs> right. that's, I think that's kind of where, uh, where I eventually just ended up, you know, wound up there just because there is nothing cooler than that. Yeah, that's the ultimate level of reach as a car guy is to become a rocket guy. Yeah, 100%. And at some point, some car guys literally become rocket guys and strap rockets to cars and try and break <laughs> land speed records. You know, like it's yeah. it's it's the same universe here. And yeah. Uh, so Elon, with your conversation with him on, on the Raptor 2, was talking about, or you were talking about, like there's an excessive amount of cooling to be on the safe side as you're developing yeah. the engine. Uh, what kind of cooling was that? So that would be film cooling. So remember how uh, a little bit ago we were talking about like keeping the turbine from melting. You can just run it off of like off nominal, basically off, you know, typically fuel rich, just run more fuel through that. So it's cool enough. 
you can actually do that uh, locally kind of in your engine so that you can keep it. So, you know, imagine a combustion chamber and the top of it's just a flat, like imagine a shower head. And then you have like, you know, the combustion chamber attached to it. The outer perimeter there, the, the part where the flame front would be touching the walls, you can actually have just more fuel injectors. So you're injecting locally a more fuel rich zone along the entire nozzle. And that would be called film cooling. So uh, it's it's less efficient though. Again, you're kind of wasting fuel. There's fuel that's running, you know, and your 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 mixture ratio is off, but only for a little portion of your the big picture, you know. So that's one of those compromises. Like you can do additional film cooling to make sure you're not melting your engine, uh, you know, but at the cost of performance usually. Um, but you can also be smart and use film cooling. You know, there's fun little clever tricks. Um, for instance, you'll notice on the F1 engine that was on the Saturn V. You know, the biggest uh, rocket that had been built to date prior now to Starship. Um, the F1 has this huge, huge, huge engines. There's five of them uh, on the Saturn V. And you'll notice that like the, the gas generator has a pipe that comes down and then it actually splits off in a manifold and wraps around part of the nozzle. Mm -hmm. And that manifold takes the hot gas uh, from the turbine, which, which is actually, I mean, it's not hot. It's actually cold gas compared to the combustion chamber, but it's, you know, in human terms, it's still, you wouldn't want to put your hand in it, you yeah. not live. Um, <laughs> and it actually pipes that gas into the nozzle so that it creates a film cooling, a, 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 an actual boundary layer of cooler gas against the hotter combustion chamber gas. So basically repurposing that gas that was normally wasted and they pump it back into the engine and then uh, into the nozzle, like kind of further down. So the, the trick there is it has to be far enough down that the pressure at the in the nozzle, because remember, as the nozzle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the pressure is getting lower and lower, and the temperature is getting lower and lower. So you have to find this trade-off point where the pressure is, is lower than that gas from the turbine, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you pump it in, and it's cooler than the, than the gas still is in the nozzle, and it can help not melt your nozzle. So you'll notice that the F1 is actually a good example of regen cooling. So the chamber walls, you can physically see the pipes actually um, on the F1 because it's so big and they just literally used pipes and bent them. And you can see the the, the coolant channels all the way up and down the, the engine until you get to that manifold. Then from there on, it just has what's called a nozzle extension and it keeps going and going and going. And that section of nozzle is cooled by the film cooling of the gas generator. I mean, the aerodynamics of cooler gas and the hot gas, because uh, you have to have this kind of layer, right? To, uh, yeah, protective layer of cool gas. Like understanding that, obviously, probably has to do in modern times. There's probably really good simulation of aerodynamics, oh, yeah. but and to do it in terms of pressure too, like um, to make sure it's in the right place. Yeah, that doesn't like go back up, go backwards. Exactly. Yeah. If they have that manifold even six inches too high on that nozzle, yeah, the, it's just going to go upwards. You know, and pressure always wants to flow from high to low. The, the number of options you have here that result in it going boom. Is very large. <laughs> Near inf infinity, yeah. Especially because, I mean, you can't do like a, a small model of it. Maybe you can. No, you can't. It doesn't you, really scale very no, well. No, you have, to, you have to do the full testing. And that's why you have all the kind of, that's that's why you have with Starship all the tests that, you know, you think, why would you need to do so many static fires and so many tests? And why is it failing so many times? Can't you get it right? But like, it's very tough to get it right. Well, and when you're pushing the boundaries, you want to know where and how it's going to fail. That's right. So you can engineer around them. So that's that's a luxury that SpaceX does have with the scale of Raptor. You know, they're building Raptor cheaper than probably almost any other engine, you know, maybe besides some of their own, at least at that scale. Um, then before they're testing, you know, I think since last March or last April, they've tested a thousand <laughs> Raptor, you know, a, a thousand engine fires, I guess, not just Raptors, but... Um, you know, that's just an insane amount of data and an insane amount of edge cases to learn. Oh my God, we found out that we were actually slightly overspinning our turbine at this degree and this frequency uh, is harmonic at this blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden we realize it's rattling and, you know, it did this. And then you can engineer around that. You know, it's like it ultimately, you know, uh, I think Elon said something like high production rate uh, solves many ills or something along those lines. And it's just true. If you have an insane amount of engines and an insane amount of data and insane amount of failures to learn from, you just know your system inside and out. You know those margins. You know where the failure points are. You know how to engineer around them. And 
That's how I approach dating. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 